Thank you for listening to Namat's Movie Reviews Podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, and MeWe. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. I don't know what's here anymore. I know I made a terrible mistake. It's a lot that you came. Just give the old man a chance. Karen is only grandkid. It's good to see you, Dad. To new beginnings. <laughs> to life. What happened? The suicide. I may have found something. It's on the knife. It's an ancient Vording inscription often to seal a body containing a demon. But in today's world, who has the know-how to play with this kind of stuff? And what if someone did? Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 496. Releasing January 13 across the US in theaters and digital is The Offering, an Hasidic horror movie that tells the story of a Jewish family in the midst of grief, dealing with a violent supernatural entity that is trying to destroy them. Continuing the rich tradition of the Jewish horror movie, The Offering is an impeccably crafted and culturally fascinating supernatural thriller. And joining me now on the podcast is the director of The Offering, Mr. Oliver Park. Uh, Oliver, I thank you so very much for your time today. Thank you for having me. So this is really interesting, especially in regards to your approach to how you usually do your movies. You usually write your own screenplays. This is very true for your short uh, films as well. In this case, though, for The Offering, you have the story by Jonathan Younger, who's also a producer in the film, no more for his action movies, Expendables and Rambos, et cetera. Um, and then you have Nick Hoffman, who wrote the screenplay, um, first-time screenwriter. Um, when they come to you with this story, um, which is very kind of like specific, especially in its kind of like its cultural kind of themes, et cetera, um, what was it about the story that really kind of appealed to you um, as someone who, number one, um, is is not necessarily of that culture. And also number two, you kind of like you write what scares you. That's what usually you, you've you've spoken of before. What was it about this movie that, that this script that really kind of uh, spoke to you and said, you know what, this is something I want to uh, uh, dip my toes into next. <laughs> uh, I will just first off, you said Nick Hoffman just there. By the way, it's Hank Hoffman. Oh, my fault. Sorry. The, uh, yeah, the name of the writer. Um, and, um, obviously, yeah, he's one of the reasons I was so excited to come on board, but well, I mean, first of all, let's just talk about, you know, Jewish horror stories, you know, they date back millennia and, you know, they're the oldest of the stories. They inspired the monsters we adore. They inspired Frankenstein. The first, the first horror franchise was a Jewish horror film, the Golem from 1915. This is before even Nosferatu came out. So as far as the Jewish side of horror is concerned, 
it was always an area that interested me and that was always going to be something I wanted to get in, involved with. But then not only that, when this script came in, I wasn't told it was a Jewish horror film. It came to me called Abizu. Mm. And Abizu, I don't know how much you know about her. She is a prolific demon, monster, creature, whatever you want to call her, that has stood the test of time. She goes back thousands of years. She is not Jewish. She crosses religions. She may, for all we know, be Lilith herself. And she was also on my list of someone to explore within the horror space, someone who's endlessly terrifying and fascinating and horrifying. So uh, this script that heavily ticked two boxes on my wish list landed on my desk and then i so i was already intrigued and i started reading it and as i've said in other interviews and it sounds like you already know this about me i am um i like to be invested in character i believe that fear you know you you earn scares and you earn fear through character and through drama uh mainly through trauma so as i was reading this script and i realized this is a drama this is a family drama where a demon comes to visit, essentially. It was it was beautifully written. The characters had so much depth. The authenticity was stunning. And I knew that this film needed someone who was going to sweat, breathe, sleep, bleed this film. And the first time I sat down with Hank Hoffman, the writer, and Jonathan Younger, the, uh, the producers... I told them about a nightmare I had, and um, it was one where... So my background is architecture, by the way, and I've worked as an architect for several years. And um, on top of that, I've always been writing horror and always obsessed horror with horror, and I have very bad nightmares. And I told them about this nightmare I had where I was surveying a crypt in a church, mm. and I was trying to use this camera just the way that Claire is in the camera scene. And I was seeing things through this lens and I was trying to take photos and I had this film part where I switched to video mode, tried to record, the rest you'll see what happens next in the film. I told them this nightmare and Hank and I just didn't stop talking after that. I told him as many scary nightmares that I had and it was so fascinating working with such a gifted writer, someone who would really you know, unpick everything and then put it back together. And he and I worked very closely together to generate more scares, more depth. I would push him as far as I possibly could for the authenticity in the story, because this is actually, so Hank grew up working in a mortuary. He actually mm. used to watch over dead bodies. So again, it was really important to me that this wasn't, it was my story to direct, but it wasn't my story to tell. It was his. So I was also heavily excited by his interest to actually work so closely with me on that script to really push Hank and to push the studio and to push everything to its absolute limits to create the best film possible. When it comes to a lot of the supernatural and perhaps even theological aspects of the movie, we are definitely dealing with uh, more kind of the, the Jewish kind of folklore and traditional aspects of things. Um, and what I love about movies that del delve into different kind of cultural aspects, especially films like a, a, a the offering where there might be similarities to other movies of the same kind of subgenre, but they approach it differently because of those specific cultural kind of things. Um, there are little things that really pop up in the movie that kind of like I take note of. In this case, I really took note of the different symbologies in without the film, especially especially what um, what, what it's called in the film as the the, uh, the sigil. I think it's called like yeah. the sacrificial altar with the the symbol of that. Is that a real kind of symbol? Is that something that's created for the film? Is that a real thing? And what else in the film is is kind of like that you found in your research? Um, that you kind of picked from from uh, folkloric or theological aspects of the of the Jewish tradition that you wanted to put in your movie, and was there perhaps things that you didn't want to touch? Maybe someone said, you know, we don't really mess with that kind of the the dark stuff. Like I, for myself, for example, in real life, I will not do anything with a Ouija board because I've seen too many horror movies to know that when you mess with that, you don't. Uh, usually, things don't really work out work out for you. Oh my God, it's one in the background. <laughs> um, but have there, have there certain things like that in? Uh, in this film or in the experience of making this film that really stick out to you yes there's you know there, there's so many and there's there's also things that that didn't make the the final cut or that didn't even make the script so 
when talking about any kind of you know symbology in a in a religious movie that the first movie that's always going to come to mind is the exorcist mm. and the fact that within the exorcist if you if you really want to push the boundaries of scaring people then you need to push them further than they're comfortable with going so because we were in such a such a fantastic space as, as the, the Jewish horror film setting in the Hasidic world, there were things we were able to use that had never been used before within film. So I was, the first thing I was looking for was, right, what's the kind of the, the Jewish, not from a religious aspect, but from a horror movie plot aspect, what's our crucifix? Hmm. What is our, you know, uh, kind of, yeah, the hero moment, saving grace. And we've obviously got the, you know, the, the prayer book of his father. Um, we've got mezuzahs as well. And mezuzahs were things that uh, we were using a lot more of in the earlier scripts when we had 250 pages to play with. There were there were a lot of other symbols that we could play with. The rituals all started as real. Hmm. They were changed slightly in different areas. So the sigil. It encompasses lots of real um, symbols and aspects of the occult, but we created that ourselves. In fact, the central symbol, which I designed for Abizu herself, that is, uh, you know, I, I just made it up. Mm. Just like the just like the Blair Witch symbol, for example, you know, it was it was created by the filmmakers, but it's all inspired by real lore, and there are even some of the spells that we do in the movie the some of the producers were having really bad nightmares back when they were genuine so we actually ended up changing them before we shot them mm. because we were yeah just like you there are some things you shouldn't do and i think that the there's a balance there when you're writing horror or when you're directing horror to know how far you go while also protecting yourself because who's to know what is going to be awoken very interesting. You know, you mentioned The Exorcist before. You hear stories of from that film and even recent movies like The Conjuring um, that deal with more kind of the Christian theological aspects of stuff. And you hear stories about, um, you know, it could be just PR stuff, but producers um, bringing in uh, a priest, for example, to bless the set before uh, mm -hmm. before filming to try to get, the, you know, some good vibes and perhaps even some good uh, post uh marketing kind of like uh, you know headlines afterwards um when it comes to the offering do you have kind of like an equivalent to like a rabbi or stuff like that that has to come on set to do any type of blessing or cleansing or anything when dealing with uh these kind of folkloric elements or is it just a we, fair we game didn't. we can go into it yeah yeah no we we didn't uh mainly because so so hank and um jonathan obviously the creators and the writers are um are Jewish themselves, and uh, they were yeah they were absolutely confident in the, the things they were saying, the things they were getting the access to say, and what was actually being written down. I don't know if they did their own rituals um, in private that may have helped, but I knew that by the time I got to set and we were designing these things, these were things in order to to push the characters to their limits and to continue the drama and the story and the trauma rather than actually saying, Hey, this is a real ritual or this is a real Ouija board and we're going to sit down and play with it and see what happens. Or in the case of paranormal activity, we're going to set a Ouija board on fire. Let's see what happens now. <laughs> I think that it's an interesting area to play and um, we'll see if anyone has any stories after watching the movie because there are some easter eggs and there are some hidden things and rituals and things in hebrew or even aramaic hidden throughout the movie so it will be interesting to see what happens after the movie comes out the matt's movie reviews podcast is brought to you by t public t public is the world's largest marketplace for independent creators to sell their work on the highest quality merchandise with over 1.2 million designs t public is sure to have something you will love the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast is brought to you by Amazon, the world's leading online store. Amazon is your first stop to buy a wide range of products at competitive prices with fast delivery times. Amazon is also a world-class entertainment hub that includes Prime Video, Audible, Twitch, Amazon Music, and more. Sign up with Amazon today and experience the best in online shopping and entertainment. Please support Matt's movie reviews on Patreon. Get access to exclusive content, request movie reviews and top 10 lists, and help support my work. 
please click on the Patreon link in the description below. I want to talk about uh, the character of art in the movies played by um, Nick Frost in the film. And, you know, you said before how drama is really kind of central to the stories that you have. In regards to the character of art, there's specific themes towards him. Um, guilt, sacrifice, grief is a big theme in the movie as well, especially. Um, and also kind of like it taps into the whole story of the prodigal son as well. Uh, throughout the film um you know nick's t- talked about um in previous interviews about how i'm gonna say sorry nick blood is in, in the film not nick frost excuse me um i want to talk about how he sp- talked about how in the initial script there's kind of like a big backstory in regards to his character in the film um how big to you is backstory in regards to your characters whether it's on script or not on script do you like to talk to your actors about backstory uh, etc so that when it comes to shooting on scene that while um, it's not, not spoken about in the film. They know exactly where their characters are coming from, um, especially in the character of Art, who um, who really does have kind of like an inner conflict in him because he is a character who essentially kind of like turns his back on his family and in on his religion. Um, and there's very traumatic reasons as to why he does that. But then he comes back and finds himself in this situation that um, he really has to face face not only demons externally but demons internally as well. Yeah. Absolutely. And yes, we we spoke at length about the backstory and the character, the traumatic events that led him to do what he felt he needed to do. So I you know, don't think that it was a case for Arthur, um, played by, as you said, Nick Blood. I don't think he would ever see it as turning his back on the community. He had such a traumatic experience growing up, and he felt that for his own safety to protect himself, probably to protect the family he had, he had to leave because who knows what would have happened if he had stayed and him coming back is partly for financial reasons as you find out in the movie but also because those bonds don't break Mm. i'm not jewish and the one thing i would say i found out about the the enormous plethora of research that i did for this film was that above all else one word comes to mind when i now think of judaism and jewish people and that is family Never have I ever seen anywhere near as strong a bond as in in that text. And I see it from Art's perspective, him wanting to come back. And you can see it in, you know, Nick did such a wonderful performance. And you can see it in the way he he holds Art that it isn't, he's not, he isn't using his dad. Although that's one way of seeing it, that's Hamish's way of seeing it. This is a guy who's deeply traumatized. Uh, he needs his father. He needed his mother. So I think Nick did an absolutely wonderful job. We were so lucky to get Nick. And everyone did. Every actor was, was such an absolute rock star. But yes, what wasn't on the page in the script was there in subtext. I think Hank did such a great job of writing the script. Any actor could have just dived into the script and dug and everything was there. But it was it was a great experience to dive deeper with the actors and also beyond that within within horror it's not just about there isn't just scary scenes and drama scenes within horror they are laced together yeah. and even in the even in the bedroom scene where there's this you know the argument between Claire and Art when it finally comes out what he's kind of come there to do there are times where you're not actually even focused on those characters or the bit where Arthur during after sitting shiver, he runs upstairs and has to rip the tefillin off himself and then the door slams closed. There are times where we, the audience, are not looking at Nick or Art. There are times we're not 100% listening. We're paying attention. We're hearing what the characters are saying. But in horror and other things, comedy is the same. There are times where we, I don't want you to be looking at me. I want you to be looking at my shadow. And when you're working with such great actors like Nick or or M or the whole cast, frankly, I was able to talk to them about when I wanted them to steal focus and when I needed them to know that I don't want the audience looking at you right now. So you have to help me out here. <laughs> you have to do almost the opposite of what an actor might usually fall upon. And that is, right, at this stage, I need to make sure you're on screen and you're talking, you're giving the information, but we have to be concentrated on this shadow behind you. And I need you to help me do that. And there are obviously tricks and things we can do with that. But when you're working with people like Nick, it's not just about talking about character. It's talking about how to 
how to you know create these magic tricks, how to create these moments so we can invoke the response of fear or sadness or whatever emotion we want to invoke in you. I want to talk about the first thing that really struck me when I watch a film, and that's the look of the movie. Um, the set design, the production design of the film is absolutely fantastic. I mean, it just really kind of just it's right there and it just so how it's all just all just put together is fantastic that's number one number one number two is the photography from lorenzo senatore and um he's done really great work as well the outpost and other great films as well um when it comes to the look of the film um there's kind of like a rich kind of like thickness to like the colors and to the vibrancy of it which i really like i love my horror films that kind of look like that um what was that uh discussions like with lorenzo and to your production design team in regards to uh, making what is essentially, I mean, it is a film that's set in a city, but we're essentially within the one place itself, um, which is interesting because that one place is kind of like two places because you have the morgue downstairs and then you have the family home upstairs, which is such an interesting kind of like a correlation between the two. Um, what's it like putting that all together in, in the movie? It was fantastic. And again, because I got to work with such fantastic people, Lorenzo and I worked very closely together and we spoke at length before we both got to Bulgaria where we shot the film, we spoke at length about various films, various uh, photographers. We put lookbooks together and there were just thousands and thousands and thousands of images in these lookbooks of you know what we needed to feel in order to really get across, and you said it very well, the richness of this community, the richness of this lifestyle and you know the depth of, and, you know, it's one of the reasons why, again, we put the morgue nice and deep below ground. You know, it's not just stairs won't get you there. You need to go in this elevator. Mm. The depth of that. And it sounds like it really is coming across, which is so nice to hear. Then with regards to the set design, again, it was a dream to work with someone like Philip Murphy, who I could, again, talk about the design with at length. As I said before, my background is architecture. So this was a chance to shoot a movie where we could design the sets from the ground up hmm. so i could design them to not only tell you more about the characters and the world they live in but also keep the sets always feeling unnerving there is always somewhere someone could be watching this kind of voyeuristic perspective especially the main ground floor where if you stand by the fridge you can see the front door through the mirror but you could also see straight down the corridor towards the coats where they're hanging in the front door and how you escape where the sigil is it wasn't, you know, just by coincidence that all those rooms happened to fall where they fell. It's to tell a kind of more deeply enriched story about how the family works, how they move, and also the fact that it increases the level of fear that you feel. The only other thing that you actually don't see in the final movie until later on in the movie is that the the elevator played a bigger part than I think possibly comes across i love that i love the elevator as a character in itself and we actually spent more time in the elevator um at one point in the script and when uh, arthur leaves the table when he's going up the stairs when claire is standing by the mirror there are various scenes where the elevator is almost watching and we really kind of pull the audience into wanting to know Right. What? What? Why is this elevator so desperate for Claire to go downstairs? And then ultimately, we we do find out exactly why. And she's kind of the final keystone in the the demon's plan. It's interesting when you said the elevator because when I was watching the film, a note that I wrote down just kind of remind me of Angel Heart. The closing the credits of that movie with the elevator as well. And uh, yes. I don't want to give away too much of it because it might give away some some spoilers in regards to uh, what's happening <laughs> yeah. in the film. But um, but yeah, it definitely it's something that because also the way that it kind of shuts as well, that kind of like that the gate as well is very reminiscent of that movie as well. And I also like the use of mirrors in the movie as well, uh, which I found very interesting um, throughout the movie. I thought it was a really kind of interesting uh, kind of approach when when you, to reflections you know, and everything else yeah you mentioned earlier on about you know using specific um you know jewish devices throughout the film and uh, mirrors were obviously a huge part of this i remember mm. when i discovered that mirrors were covered for shiva for you know jewish funerals and it just it, oh, I, my mind just exploded with excitement of how much fun you can have asking desperate questions well, why are they covered and there's so many different answers and I, again another fascinating side of Judaism is that there are so many different answers to to to, to the questions 
So, you know, obviously within horror, that's great. But yes, mirrors, there would... I'm really hoping that we are able to continue this story, either a prequel or a sequel or a TV show or something within the, the kind of the Abizu, the offering area, because there are things that we can do to further these stories that, you know, that, that weren't expressed in the in the opening, I would say. So I would say, you know, if, if we do continue with this story and there are more movies to follow, which I very much hope that there will be, this is just the opening. This is just the beginning. And there's a lot more to come. Just like myself and the writer sat down with the actors and we talked so much about backstory and future story, Abizu herself has her own backstory of how she how she went from human or demon to human to ram to both. There's so much there. There's so much depth. So there's yeah, there's a hell of a lot more to tell. I think so as well. And I remember um listening to an interview that you did that not only is there more in the Abizu story, but just in the kind of like the rich uh, uh folklore of Jewish folklore, there's so many aspects in that as well that can spiral out into different stories. So when you and Hank are talking about Abizu, are you kind of like putting notes aside for, for perhaps our future uh uh demons or or characters or et cetera that you could perhaps even tap into for future projects as well? Absolutely, yeah. Well, we've got at the moment, we've got um, we've got this Kabbalist, we've got this kind of, you know, magician in Chaim, and uh, this is someone who, you know, is forced to deal with a, a non-Jewish demon. You know, Abizu is not a, a Jewish demon, but it would be fantastic for this character to explore the demons and for this story to continue. Or even if it's you know a different area of Judaism, we're able to go to a, a different a different community or a different type of. Sorry, I'm just stumbling now because yeah, you've just you've excited me. Mm. I think that of course, ultimately, when I'm working with Hank, I'm writing down so much, and so is he. And who knows? It's very difficult when you're writing a movie or a book or anything to assume there will be more to come. So you have to keep the, the kind of the bookended nature of the business, I suppose, hmm. in your mind at any given time. But yes, this story inspired an enormous amount. And I'm so glad that you know I learned so much from Hank and I learned so much from the team. Hopefully that's more I can take on to the next film. My journey is just to continue exploring fear and I've learned a lot through this film, so be wary of the next. <laughs> <laughs> so if everyone out there listening, January 13 across the US in theatres and digital, the offering, I really recommend people do check it out in theatres if you have a chance, if there's a cinema new um, and the film is showing because not only, um, we, as we spoke, um, a lot of the, the, uh, the, the look of the film is fantastic, the sound, sound design as well. It's really fantastic and really key to a lot of aspects in the movie. So to to watch and to listen and to experience a film on the biggest screen as possible with a bit with a really good uh, system, stereo system, uh, sound system is uh, I think the way to go uh, with the offering. Um, and I really do appreciate your time today, Oliver. Congratulations with the movie, and hopefully uh, we get to talk again in the future. It's been fun to talk today. It's been amazing. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews, podcast interviews, and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.